Okay, well, I have show and tell. Okay, show and tell. You did show and tell last yeah. week, but I have it. It's got there. In one piece, and you're not kidding, it is um, heavy. Heavy. So for those of you who are listening to the podcast, I'm holding up the, the most amazing award gift gesture I don't even I don't even have words. I had a whole week to think of words and I still don't have words. Um it's amazing and I I keep moving it all around my house because I don't know where to put it yet. Because yeah. it is um it is beautiful and it's nothing that's going to go in a closet or in a box. It's going to be on display. So I had it in my china hutch because yeah. I bought uh we found the last 3 on the planet. Um three three years ago and it's Costa Boda and it's hand blown crystal and um so the award that Jeff Bland got had a red ball see the bottom where there's the blue ball yes Jeff Bland had a red ball and then a blue top so cool and then then that one I've been hanging on to and then there you then I there you are. It's, I just wanted you to see it in my hands. I'm so excited. That's a that's a Kodak moment there. And the plaque is at work because it deserves to be at the clinic for everybody to see. So yeah. the Ruth Johnson Award is at the clinic. Yay. And after I picked it up, I noticed that in the past I put the year on it. So yours is 2019. I didn't want to delay sending it to you to take it back and have them engrave the year. So it, the year is on the plaque. And so there you go. It all works. And next year's recipient, you're going to be there to yeah. help present. And then Catholi is going to be there. Oh. So all the previous recipients that are present at that conference come up to the stage and present it to the new one. It's, oh, that's amazing. What a beautiful gesture of passing like the torch and growing the tribe well and it's also my way of saying thank you to the people it's the only way i have to say thank you to the people that have helped us grow so if you look at um jim oshman and christy hughes got the first one um because she was the reason that we started at ncnm she planted the seeds there and then jeff had me on and then diana cross carried the torch in australia she and jim oshman got them at the same time because they were both in town at the same time mary ellen chalmers got it because she um uh got fsm patented in dentistry so it's and then you brought FSM sports into existence. By the way, we're rebuilding the FSM website and we're, you know, there's the five day core, there's the three day module, the other three day module. And then um, FSM sports last week, we changed it to physical medicine and rehab, right? Yes. Okay. Our physical medicine integration, or we had a couple of different words I jotted down, but something like that. Yes. Okay, so that's what it's going to be on the FSM website. Yes. It's being put on by FSM Sports, I guess. So we'll figure that out. We'll figure out the logistics, but... Yeah, but it, that's yours. So that's exciting. We're getting the website front end redesigned. The, backs, the back end is all integrated, but we have a new web designer that's doing the front page that just makes it cleaner, more nav easier to navigate and look at so that's like Perfect. the next step i got my hair cut today and I'm looks great pieces of hair you know how you have little yeah anyway <laughs> i'm glad it came congratulations thank you no thank you thank you thank you it's it's more than than words it's it it means more than any other kind of award or acknowledgement and I can't explain really why and it's kind of going with the theme today because we're still going to continue with our blossoming um theme but I actually wanted to invert it a little bit 
we think of blossoming as something that is expanding up and outwards, but sometimes we have to go inwards and go a little deep to think about what we want to do. Blossoming always starts with dormancy. So you have winter. Yes. Then you have buds. Yes. And then from buds, you go to blossoms. So one of the, I think one of the reasons that the Ruth Johnston Award has, she had no idea I was going to do this, but the reason it has such an impact on people in the FSM community is Ruth's the, the comment she made to her brother. She, she got to a point where she had bone metastasis. She couldn't, it was just too much trouble to stay alive. And she said, I really wanted to make it to the symposium, but tell Dr. McMakin, I'll help her from the other side. And that, yeah, that, and that is, I, it's like, that's the found, that intention is the foundation. So you all are, have helped FSM on this side. Right. But I suspect we have a cheering section on the other side between the patients and the practitioners and the Ruth Johnstons and the Harry Van Gelders and the Margie Clemenses, all those people that have helped us. There's otherwise FSM doesn't make sense. Right. Right. What technique grows from no precedent? Yeah. Now, science in general is incremental. You take this step and then somebody takes another little step and little step and it's incremental. FSM has grown incrementally, but it came from nowhere. And for it to come from nowhere and end up with 4,000 practitioners, 23 countries, um, two books, well, three if you count, four, five if you count the book chapters, 12 published papers, it's like, and I'm a chiropractor from Oregon. That doesn't happen without the kind of support and validation that people of quality. What is that? Oh, and Jim Turner. Yes, Jim Turner is now on the other side helping to cause trouble. So we're, hoping, <laughs> we're looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so it, it, that doesn't happen without... The, number one, the fact is that FSM works. Right. So, but there are people that take it and make it work. And so I, I love the award you gave me. And I, I'm not deflecting. I'm really grateful. And it's like, it's absolutely gorgeous. And everybody has to understand that FSM is the star because it works or you guys wouldn't be using it, right? right? So there you go. So tell me about the bud. So I'm not even sure if it's the bud or if it is the seed that's growing roots first. Okay. So, and what I mean by that, I think early in our FSM, um, careers or in our early in, in the, in the journey, yes. we want the protocols that will create the most change most of the time, right? And so I'll, I'll say that a lot of times to the new practitioners, like you want to start with statistically what's going to make the most impact, right? You want, you don't want to go on the far recesses of your brain too soon because it gets too muddled up. And when you're ready, you take the advanced and then your brain explodes and you're cleaning it up all over the ballroom over the next three days. And then you're putting it back together. So I get a lot of questions about a lot of the advanced frequencies that we don't seem to talk about that much. And I always, my advice is just try it. What's your hypothesis? Make sure that it's rooted in something uh, logical that makes sense, that is safe within your scope of practice and try it can't hurt might help <laughs> and by and large if you you can get about 80 percent 
most people don't get weird patients that we get, but the normal patient population that comes in with low back pain or neck pain or in our world, something easy like phantom limb pain, that is, I know, that is, that's covered in the core. Yes. And you can get 80 to 85% of what walks in the door out of the core. People want frequencies. Well, I need a frequency. There's got to be an advanced frequency for whatever. And it's like, well, and it takes almost two years. Now, I lie a little bit in the core saying that the learning curve is three to six months. Ooh. It's Yeah, I know. It's my nose is growing, right? <laughs> yeah. But the truth of the matter is that it takes probably a year or two to get to get comfortable and for your equipment to pay for itself and then you buy more equipment so that when so Sandra, Dr. Osterberg was treating somebody with abdominal pain from endometriosis and pelvic pain. And this patient could, could not stand to be touched on the skin of her abdomen. And we're talking about what she did for scar tissue and blood clots and inflammation in the abdomen. And, and, the, and then I said, and you used, yeah, yeah, yeah. I used 40 and 10 on one machine, 40 and 89 on the other machine. And then I treated her abdomen. So 40 and 10 means that you're reducing spinal cord pain sensitization before you ever touch her abdomen. Yeah. And 40 and 89, if, if you have a patient that can't be touched superficially for abdominal pain, then she is centrally ampl amplified. She yeah. reports her pain as a seven. She's not suppressing. Yeah. So it's safe to do 40 and 89 on one machine, 40 and 10 on the other machine. And then now that your machines have paid for themselves, then you can work on the abdominal adhesions and inflammation. Right. So that's what takes the learning curve. Yes. Is figuring out after six months or a year that you need to do all three things at one time. And that's all, it's all in the core but you don't see it until the fourth time you go through the slides. Right. Right. And it's, it's hard because you want to tell the new patient or the new practitioners, you need four machines and you have to run them all at the same time. If you really want to get your hair blown back, but you can't do that. No. And you have to go in baby steps. And I get it in the beginning, we might lose some practitioners because depending on what kind of patient walks in their door or what their, what their patient load looks like, they're hitting that roller coaster loop really early on. They may not have that really slow trajectory that people who work with easy patients like athletes, I had no idea how easy I had it. Sorry, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I know I treated the vast majority of my patients, 90% of them were athletes. So super healthy um, compliant patients. Yes, you're under a gun to get them better faster, but that's the easy part with FSM. It's the ones that it's the other 10%, the ones that you warn us about in the core that have tried everything and have literally seen everybody. And that's who's walking into your clinic. Yeah, exactly. So, um, my whole, my whole thinking about going inward and going downward and, and everything was a little bit of just looking laterally and not being afraid to try, not being afraid to try, I guess would be the whole thing and not being afraid to talk to that skeptic that's in the back of your head. And that's for the patients too, that are listening, because this is weird. Um, you don't feel FSM until you feel it and you love it. And you're coming back just because you like that floaty feeling, but I guess it's just learning to deal with the patients and practitioners who are closed-minded. Well, if their patients are closed-minded, they don't come to you. 
I mean, well, you're probably not seeing them, but a lot of the new practitioners that are just learning to incorporate FSM into maybe an established practice might have to deal with this. Well, yeah. And we have, um, I have a practitioner as physical therapist who's moving from Portland where she's known for treating with FSM. She's moving to Iowa to a college town. Yeah. And she said, I just don't want to deal with all the, what is FSM? I don't want to have to explain it. It's like, why would you explain it? Right. You're you're a physical therapist. You are a manual therapist. So you advertise yourself as a manual physical therapist um, using exercise therapy. And you have ways of treating nerve pain, phantom limb pain, shoulders, whatever. But you're a manual therapist and... Physical therapists always use electrical stem. Absolutely. So why would you why would you set yourself up to have people take shots at you? Absolutely. So yeah. I, this I'm going to put this contact around your neck and this contact around your upper arm, and this electrical stim is physiologic at the same time type that your body produces on its own. So you aren't gonna feel a current, but the frequencies that it uses have been shown to reduce inflammation and that pain you have in your arm, part of it is part, due to inflammation in the nerve. So we're gonna reduce the inflammation in the nerve and then we'll see what we can do about the adhesion. See this sore spot up here in your armpit? Okay. Well, we'll see if we can make that less. And then there, there we go. And so someplace in the resonance effect and someplace in my life selling pharmaceuticals, I just made the decision never to argue with skeptics. Right. It's like, well, why would you believe it? Let's just see if it works. It's not gonna hurt you. Right. Okay. There's, it's it's how you do bullfighting. You don't stand in front of the bull and punch it in the nose. You distract them and step to the side and they run by. Right. Works for me. That's a great analogy. I like that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't, I think we're like creatures of making things more difficult than they need to be. You know, we complicate things much more than it needs to be complicated. So the new practitioners, I mean, you said it exactly right. Like we all have a background in something else. So if you are really good at manual therapy, you're still doing manual therapy. If you're doing exercise rehabilitation, you're still doing exercise rehabilitation. And most of us who are doing these things have a license to use e-stem or, you know, electrical stem of some sort. It's no different. I mean, it's very, you and I both know it's very different, but it's no different than the practitioner. So you don't have to come at it like, I'm going to put this stuff on, you now. I mean, no, you're, you just attack it with the same professionalism. You would any other modality and, and off you go. Well, and even the nature paths, medical physicians, some chiropractors um, that are treating things like SIBO and gastroparesis and ovarian cysts and OBGYNs that are treating abdominal adhesions and ovarian cysts and asthma and all that stuff. Um, the device, you have to have a pain code in order to bill insurance for right. the device, but for the patient, All you have to say is just keep it simple. They don't need to know about me. They don't need to know about Harry. You can keep copies of the resonance effect around if they want to know, what did you just do to me and why is that pain gone? Here, read this. There's also the FSM FAQ brochures that uh, frequency specific cells in packets of 25, put those at the front desk. Um, But when you're treating SIBO, you, the patients are used to being given a diet that doesn't work and they are used to having SIBO for five or 10 years. And it's like, okay, so this time, and their belly hurts, their, their abdomen is tender. Yeah. So you put the SIBO protocol on and you just put warm washcloth under their back and you put a warm washcloth on their tummy and you, and you say, now this, this helps 
reduce the inflammation in your intestines. And, um, and I'm, I just am going to be checking for the tender spots to make sure that it, that it improves. This usually makes people get better faster. There you go. Perfect. Simple yes. Explanations. And yes. then why is this thing around my neck? Well, the vagus nerve runs from here down to your tummy and the vagus nerve um, has sensors that sense the bacteria in your intestines. So the vagus nerve gets to vote. So this around your neck also is connected to this down washcloth here on your tummy. And um, it you just the current will help the vagus nerve work fat better. And that will help your tummy get better faster. Simple. Keep it yes. simple. Yes. Don't start, don't start fights you can't win. Well, yes. And that's <laughs> that's funny how I attack musculoskeletal pain because people will say that muscle's been tight forever. And I'm like, oh, it'll learn that I always win. And they're like, oh. You do? Yeah. I'm like, yep, yeah, I do. Yeah, keep it simple. They don't need to know how I'm going in. It's just like ex explaining, um, we talk about charting. Um, a massage therapist isn't gonna say, I treated you know, John Smith's kidney today. No, you didn't do that. You treated their QL and their low back pain, but you used frequencies. And their psoas. And right, exactly. All those, and it's never the psoas. And you and I both know that, but you don't need to scare them by saying you have scarring in your ureter. That's absolutely, <laughs> but some people would like to do that. Um, but keep it simple. It, well, and this is the part, and I talk about it, but there's only so much time in the, in the core. There's one slide about it. And it's like, you're fine as long as you can put your ego and your insecurity in a box and put it in the closet and just keep it there while you're at work. So the only reason you would tell somebody we're treating scarring in your ureter is if you feel the need to be validated yourself. Right. I, I, need to show off by telling you that I'm dissolving the scar tissue between your ureter and your psoas. Do you have any proof that that's what you're doing? No, right. absolutely not. Yeah. And it's like this frequency set usually does. Oh, look, see, that's not so, oh, look it. Oh, and your pelvis just, hmm, that's interesting. Well, that usually works. Now let's go. Oh, see that little tender spot down there. Let me try a different thing. And then you go to 13 and 37 and you just release there's no time in that conversation when the words, I am treating scarring in the bladder, scarring in the ureter, scarring the kidneys, sclerosis in the fat pad is the one that really gets them. Yes. Because their entire, then you have to teach them to walk again. And that's another conversation. But it's like, wait, that doesn't hurt. Yeah. Right. So I think, I think that is the, um, that confused look on their face when the pain goes away is maybe my most favorite. I love teaching people how to walk again and how to do all the, the sporting activities that they love, but it's the moment in time when they are aware of the absence of pain. It's, it's beautiful. It gets you right in right in the heart when you, when you see that, you know, and I used to always say, well, what's wrong? Nothing. Hang on for a minute, you know, and they're almost afraid to move and then they kind of move. And then again, it's that look as they start pushing, you know, the boundaries of movement and they're like, it doesn't hurt. And they're almost afraid to get up off the table or to like leave the room. I'm like, the room is not magic. <laughs> there's not, there's nothing special happening in here. It's going to continue. Speaking of new things, yeah, but I had a thing this week that was yep. just like so wicked cool. Actually, it was last week. Get it. So she had a um, lumpectomy and 14 lymph nodes removed from her axilla. 12 of them were positive. And then she had radiation and she's had chest pain and this really deep pain well, you can't see. It's like right up there, just yeah, up in the axilla. 
And I looked it up and it's a cutaneous branch of the brachial, some median brachial nerve or something. It's just this little spot right here is numb. But right there, she said, it's really deep. So the first session I just treated inflammation in the nerve, scarring in the nerve, because she couldn't raise her arm over her head, scarring in the nerve. And she said, no, there's still a really deep pain there. And I thought that's well, periosteum. And I explained how radiation goes all the way through. Mm -hmm. So we treated the bone, we treated the lung, this and that. And I said, well, you're coming back tomorrow. Let's see. So, and then her range of motion was about 170. And at the end of the session, it was, you know, full, maybe it was one. And I said, she said, oh no, I could do that before. And I went, hmm, okay. So the next day she came back and she said, there's just this really deep pain. When does it hurt? Well, just randomly. What are you doing when it randomly hurts? Watching Netflix, is it usually worse? And I couldn't get a straight answer out of her. She was really not a good historian. But I thought, if you cut a nerve, you end up with phantom limb pain, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And you can radiate a nerve and kill the blood supply, but it's much more likely since the, this location was where it was, mm -hmm. that in the process of the surgery, this little tip of this nerve was cut. And I thought, phantom limb pain in your armpit? I've never treated phantom limb pain in the armpit, but it acts like phantom limb pain. It's worse at night. Mm -hmm. It's worse when she's quiet. Exercise makes it better. Well, if it was a scarred nerve, exercise would not make it better. Yeah. If it's worse at night, hmm, phantom limb pain in the armpit. Okay. So I had three machines between her neck and her axilla. Mm -hmm. And I treated 40 and 396, 81 and three, increased secretions in the nerve on two of them. But one of them was phantom limb pain, 40 and 89, to quiet down the thalamic representation of that nerve. Yeah. And it was done. She said, no, it's still. And then she really started digging. She said, I can't, I can't find it. It's, where'd, where'd it go? And I said, I think it's gone. Now you're coming, this was, I saw her Tuesday and Thursday. And I said, I want you to come back next Tuesday and we'll make sure that it stays gone. Right. Still gone over the weekend, done. She said, well, do I need a custom care? It's like, I don't think so. Yeah. It doesn't usually come back. I mean, there are a lot of things that custom cares are good for, but for this pain in your armpit, Right. Let's, let's go on this for a minute because it kind of piggybacks on a comment that I had that um, somebody had quoted you saying there was a condition Dr. Carroll mentioned that when it comes back, you don't mind it as much. Do you remember what can, so there's a lot of chronic conditions, people who come to see us that when we take the pain away, sometimes the pain does come back, but you don't mind it as much. And I credit that a lot to 40 and 89. Once you run that, um, when you're running a lot of the other frequencies. I remember saying, I'm not sure if they heard it right. Yeah. So what I tell patients, especially the 40 and 10, the fibromyalgia from spine trauma patients. Yeah. So they come in with their pain at an average of a 7.4. Right. And get it down to a zero. And then the conversation you have with them is um, it's not going to last. Mm -hmm. It'll last any place from two hours to two weeks. When it comes back, it won't be as bad. Yeah. You are going to mind it more because it was gone. Right. That's, that was the actual quote. The, and I know exactly that that sequence is something I repeat multiple times. Okay. It, it's, this is not going to last. It is unlikely to last. It's going to last any place from two hours to two weeks. Right. When it comes back, it's not ever going to be a seven or an eight again. It'll come back at a five or a six, but you're going to mind it more because it's a zero now. Right. And 
the next time that I treat it, it's there's no reason that you should believe this it's going to work. So I'm going to schedule you for three days from now. And we'll treat it again if it comes back. And then by the third session, you expect it to go away. And once you've crossed that hurdle, then they know they can always get out from under it. And then they mind it less when they know that they can get out from under it. Right. Right. That's it. Yeah. That's a very, um, those are good. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, um, and sometimes the pain changes, right. Depending on maybe not something like, um, the case that you're talking about, but sometimes old chronic injuries, we'll just say frozen shoulder. And I'm putting this in air quotes because frozen shoulder isn't real for all you people that are listening. Um, the old chronic frozen shoulder patients, you'll do again, you'll take the eight out of 10 pain and you'll put it down to two and you'll increase maybe 40 degrees of range of motion. And then they come back and they still have all that range of motion. And they're like, but now it hurts somewhere else. I'm like, well, yeah, it's (laughs) (laughs) and I'll say that a little more, um, professionally, some actually, sometimes I'm not, I'm like, yeah, no kidding. And they're like, you expected that. I'm like, I even told you that when you left, like we're not done after one treatment, things are going to move. And you want that. You don't ever want somebody to say it's the same, right? That I will work and work and work and work till I'm blue in the face until I create something. I'll make them worse and have a party before I let it go at nothing. Well, and the other thing that we explain is that uh, I never treat the same thing twice. No. So you treat one thing, you get the range of the motion in the shoulder from 695 to 180. Yeah. But then the neck, the low back, the anterior shoulder muscles, all the ribs, have, yeah. ribs have an opinion about it. So this one of the ladies I treated this week, um, we release, she had scarring in her esophagus from a chemical injury. We treated scarring in the esophagus. So now she could sit up straight. Yeah. And I have my pulley in the gym now. And so we put um, half a pound on a pulley and had her exercise her serratus to Mm. put her shoulder into retraction. Well, we get into the treatment room after the gym and she said, oh, it's sore right there. Well, her shoulder had been forward and the pec minor had been short and tight for seven years. And then all of a sudden she can sit up and we're retracting her shoulder. So the pec minor is going, excuse me? Yes. So while I was treating the thing on our list that day, I put a second machine on 124 and 77, and after 60 minutes, the pec minor was fine. It's like, oh, goody, this is why. Oh, right. So I have a story similar to that. One of my favorite patients right now is um, uh, an ex athlete, um, not a 20 year old. I'll just leave it as that had a lot of health conditions that kind of caused a um, kyphosis folded over um, normal adhesions kind of thing. Totally. Yeah. But it took some time to get through the abdominal adhesions. There was some parasite work. There was metal toxicity work. There was a lot of work that we had to do first. The history was very crystal clear, which was fantastic. It was like this, this, and this, I got sick on this trip. Then this happened. So it was very easy for me to work through it. His um, partner is also a PT. So she's bringing a plethora of knowledge who is also FSM trained into it. So it's fantastic. It's like, you could like set my hair on fire in the room. So many fun things are happening. But I really had to work through the process over the last, you know, three, four appointments because you have to release all the adhesions before you can convince the nervous system that standing straight is something that is safe. He can do it, 
But why would he when there is abdominal scarring and it is more comfortable and it is safer this way? So I always admit when I am wrong, I don't like the 58s. I never use them when it comes to musculoskeletal. However, they had a brief moment in time where they helped with some abdominal adhesions. Yep. Sorry. So I will say that <laughs> I have never completely tabled them, but I table them a lot and I use them very briefly. They seem to have done the trick. Scarring in the diaphragm, scarring in the vagus was a religious experience. Scarring in the vagus is magic. I didn't want to take my hands off of him. And I know I had to go like super deep to do some work, but all I wanted to do was just lay my fingers gently and watch him breathe. Because the first breaths after you're releasing scarring in the diaphragm were, again, it's that look on their face like, I get more air, I get more air, I get more air, there's more air, I can breathe. And you just see the ribs and everything expand. It was like he was going to, fill up the whole room and it was it was amazing watching them move so the the lady with the mess the lumpectomy and the radiation she was all of her breath was in her belly she wouldn't move her chest and it's like no 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 and the towels were along the spine and along the front and inflammation in the nerves because she was hyperesthetic from pretty much from T3 to T12 on both sides because of the radiation. Yeah. Inflammation in the nerve and then scarring in the nerve and then talking her into starting to breathe. But that didn't actually work until I did scarring in the vagus. So yeah. when you think of the vagus, it comes out of the skull, diaphragm, diaphragm esophagus and um, bronchi. Yeah all the way down into the abdomen. And if you're going to expand the chest, so there are fibers of the vagus that go to the heart, the lungs, there it's everywhere. Yep. So you have to treat scarring in the vagus and then watching her learn to expand her chest. Yes. Just like the coolest thing. Oh, I know. And then <laughs> her idea of wipe and load. Yes. So first, the first thing we had to do is just like, just, I had one machine just doing 40 and 89. Just yep. tell the hippocampus, just go to take a nap. It'll be, <laughs> fine. we'll, we'll wake you up when, when it's, when it's all safe. Right. <laughs> That's totally it. I do. I have this little image of a hippocampus with a blankie and a teddy bear just in the corner going, fine, I'll take a nap. Yeah. And then the party happening in the other room saying, okay, fine, you can come now if you behave. Really? It's fine. It's, oh, it's no, I said when it's fine now. Yeah. Yeah. It's not fine. Let's get to a couple of questions before we circle back to our okay. blossoming uh, plant here. All right. Manette, um, question number one, a premature baby having some respiratory issues would 124 and 17 work? I do the, the whole sequence. 970, eh, maybe not 970, but 294, trauma, paralysis, allergy reaction, torn and broken, and a lot of vitality. So preemies, the alveoli and the secretions, you don't want to increase secretions in the lung, but the alveoli haven't developed. Mm. So you want to do vitality, torn and broken, and just the whole sequence, maybe even inflammation, but watch what makes the baby still babies are fun to work on because there's no placebo effect right so you just hook them up or hook mom up and have mom hold an infant and then just put your thumb on the baby's um, calf just feel for smush or watch the baby fall asleep it's like well that's a good one or watch the mom fall asleep right but that's that's worthwhile okay good but where did my questions go Okay, the next one is Peronis and a custom care. Hmm. Mm. Okay. Um, oh, would you like to explain what that condition oh, is to our Peronis is a it's a it's scarring in the connective tissue in the penis. So if you look at the structure of the penis, there's um, three chambers that are all lined 
I, I would have thought of them as fascia, but they turn out to be connective tissue. Okay. There's a frequency for the urethra. There's a frequency connective tissue, the penis itself. And I think there might be a few other frequencies in the advanced for the structures in the penis. You just treat it for scarring. It's not a one visit fix. The best luck I've had is, and if, okay, and you're, uh, Cynthia, okay. For female clinicians treating male patients, hmm. put a washcloth behind their sacrum and you take a washcloth and you have, hand it to the patient and you have the patient handle his own plumbing, drape him, cover him, and just have him feel for anything that feels different. Mm -hmm. The trick with Peronis is, as with any scar tissue, you have to move it right. while the scar tissue links are still soft, which means you treat him at the end of the day. So he's the last patient of the day you keep a staff person in the room with you. Mm -hmm. It's always chaperoned. So I've treated enough of these to know the drill. It's always chaperoned. And then you tell him, go home. And in the next 60 to 90 minutes, try having an erection. Because what happens is erections are painful. And erections are parasympathetic. Ejaculation is sympathetic in terms of the nervous system. Right. Well, it's hard to stay parasympathetic when it hurts. Right. So see what happens when you have an erection. Okay, then they come back in two days. The best luck I had was with a patient that bought his own custom care. Um, and um, he treated himself three days a week. And after about a year, I said, oh, by the way, how did that work? He said, it's great. It's completely gone. Wow. Otherwise, they, they'll come twice a week for three weeks usually, and they get enough improvement that it's they're pretty happy with it. But it's I don't have enough cases to say it's a slam dunk. Right. So Minette has a second question for a toddler who had a failed tongue-tied scar was formed and wondering what the application of FSM recommendations on how to apply it in the mouth, thinking of giving a wet contact on a pacifier. Any other suggestions? Uh, one of the patients I treated this week had scarring in her mouth from that chemical accident. And I put adhesive electrodes. So you take your two by two pads. So faces are oily. So you take a two by two pad and you trim it down so it'll fit on a baby's face put one on each flat section, just at the zygomatic arch, one just below the um, jaw. Mm -hmm. So red on the right, black on the left, on the flat part of the neck, there and there. And then you can put the pacifier in the baby's mouth or um, have mom dip her finger. So wash her hands or give her a latex glove and dip it in sugar water, mm -hmm. sugar water, something sweet that the baby will like, mm -hmm. or breast milk or whatever. And you have her get her finger in, in there. I'm not sure what failed tongue tied, how they can fail. They go in and they snip the frenulum. Right. Did they not snip it or they snipped it and it's scarred down again. So for this patient that I treated this week. What it said here, scar was formed. So maybe that's maybe more scarring formed after the snap. Uh, another conversation. Anyway, um, the, um, I had to look up the structure of the tongue. So I had netter open and it's like, oh, it's connective tissue, it's arteries, it's veins, it's nerve. And then the mucosal membrane in the mouth is part of what forms the frenulum. It's, the, it's a folding. So even fascia might work, but it's connective tissue. And that's the two frequencies for the advanced 132 and 243 for the mucosal tissue. And you just run 13. On a baby, you might try 51. Um, that was the other thing this week that was so cool. The lady with the scarring in her mouth, they yeah. showed me her 
driver's license picture from before I worked on her and the driver's license picture after I worked on her in 21. And her face is a completely different shape because the scarring in her face, in her mouth and her jaw just disappeared. Oh, that is so great. That is so cool. So cool. Um, yeah. Um, so, and the other, what was the other thing with the tongue? Um, arteries, veins. Oh, the vagus nerve. Right has branches into the mouth for saliva. So you'll treat scarring in the nerve as well. So you never know what they cut. So there you go. Jane had wrote a suggestion um, using a spoon. Um, she's using oh. a silver spoon in the mouth for a nutrition client whose tongue was paralyzed by COVID long haulers. Electrodes were attached to the spoon outside the mouth. She's beginning to be able to move her tongue again after several weekly treatments. Obviously with a toddler, you would have to hold the spoon so the leads don't come off, right? Client moves the tongue around in her mouth, all around, moves the tongue around in her mouth, all around the tongue. I'm guessing all around the spoon, but very neat. That's way to be innovative. Jane, good idea. But the other thing you need to know is that the vagus nerve innervates muscles in the tongue. Yes. It's, it's, there are certain, it's not all of it. But if it's after COVID, the vagus nerve is deactivated by infection, stress, and trauma. So if you've had COVID, you have an infection. So run the virus frequencies right. in the vagus. And there's a frequency for the tongue, which is 43, which is the same one as the frequency for the pharynx. Hmm. But the thing that made the biggest difference in the scar tissue in this patient's mouth back in the like in the back of the tongue there's a there's a groove at the base that lets you move your tongue right and that responded to 70 the frequency for the gums i think i told you last week yeah yeah that I, was amazing it's like, so wait. cool yeah a couple cool. more questions um caroline um parietal salivary gland stone would you use no. 9153 no no pads in the mouth just on either side of the face and then let the patient, uh, putting your finger in somebody's mouth is kind of weird. And it's against the scope of practice for most professions. Right. So give the patient a glove, let the patient massage it, show, open the book and net or show them where the parietal salivary gland is so they know what they're doing. But you apply the frequencies with sticky pads. You don't put electrodes in the mouth. Right. Like, no. No. Um, Summer, close friend had serious leg pain with fasciculations in his legs, had low back surgery that was unsuccessful. Sometime later, he had another surgery, but they went in from his abdomen that time. Hmm. He the suffered. Fusion. At the 360 fusion, it's what they should have done in the first place. Right. You need to do both facets and discs. They do, they do the, um, that, can you go rescue the cat? Um, that's the cat being attacked by the dog out in the hallway. Um, it's, there's one cat that gets along, goes along with the gag. There's another cat that doesn't care for it at all. And the dog just figures it's a cat. Of course I can play with it. Right. Oh, where was I? Oh, um, 60 fusion. Yeah. So you do the disc from the front. There's a general surgeon that opens the abdomen. The assistant takes basically your intestines and pulls them away from the front of the spine they go in, they pull the disc out from the front, just from it, like an anterior C-spine, pull the disc out from the front, put in spacers. Ken Johnston holds the record with his orthopedic surgeon partner for doing a 360 fusion in 60 minutes. Normally they take in the US, they take three hours. Wow. So you do the abdomen, you put everything back, you roll the patient over on their belly and you do the facets. So you do a laminectomy plates and screws and it's done. Wow. And um, so yes, so. scar tissue sounds like an issue. Kim, yes, I am near Oakland. I'm 35 minutes from Oakland. Um, I'm, I would love to see him. That should be easy. <laughs> I, yeah. 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 That's yep. Um, Jane wrote, I didn't specify what frequencies, all that you mentioned. Good job, Jane, Jane. Caroline. Oh, it's her 12 year old. Um, with the salivary glandstone. 
then okay. definitely let the 12 year old put their own finger in their mouth. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. I think there was one more question before I move on. I think it was in the chat. I think I saw it pop up. Yes, there's something in the chat here. Um, Chianti syndrome. Did we talk about that? Maybe we did. Um, yeah, new client that had surgery 20 years ago, had four surgeries, goodness, um, that include releasing scar tissue, um, whole body thoracic tethering, teetering, teetering, tethering. 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 No, it's like, it's okay. Um, so I always know when you adjust, when you stand up and sit back down, it's like, you, you have to like get emotionally ready to talk about this. Yes. Because <laughs> I only see the ones that fail. Right. I'm sure they must work. <laughs> like the Tommy John surgery. Why would you move the ulnar nerve? Yes. That's a good phase. So carry surgeries. For those of you that don't know, a Chiari malformation is, is the opinion or observation that somehow the foramen magnum is too big or the spinal cord is too short. Right. Okay. And so the cerebellum gets pulled down into the foramen magnum. Yeah. And to a certain extent, it's tolerable, but there will come a point when it interferes with balance. The patient has headaches. Um, and when it's combined with Ehlers-Danlos, it is, it's a nightmare because what they do in a Chiari um, surgery is they modify the and magnum, they can't make it smaller. I think they make it bigger so that the cerebellum doesn't get compressed when it gets pulled down. It just leaves more room for the cerebellum to be down in that little ditch. And if you look at Netter, at the nerves that are at the occiput C1 and C2, there's this whole network. The dura attaches at the foramen magnum, right? Mm -hmm. So the dura around your skull, when they go in there and they change the size of the frame and magnum, then there's always bleeding. So the tethering comes for, if, uh, and then there's scar tissue because, uh, because, yeah. and then the tethering comes because the dura was short to begin with. And now that it's, there's bleeding up above, all it takes is one drop of blood leaking down on the inside and you have. So what do you do? The ones that I've treated successfully, number one, they usually have horrible headaches and that's C2 neuritis. So you have one machine that goes from the neck to the top of the head to treat the C2 nerve if they have headaches. The place you start is 40 and 10 because most of them have tethered cords. I do 124 and 77. So you do the bait and score on them, find out if they are hypermobile as well as. So 40 and 10 is the body pain, 13 scarring in the dura, scarring the cord. So you let them cook for a while, see if 40 and 10 takes down the body pain. Then you start treating scarring in the cord scarring in the dura. I used to do that, do it with one machine. And now I run two machines because I have them. Each frequency, so, each one with one, one yeah, on dura, so, one on cord. Yeah. One on the cord, one on the dura. And the thing to remember about the dura is it's got vertical fibers and it's got rotational fibers. So they're mm -hmm. fibers that go around and fibers that go straight up and down. So you have them first without bending their head, have them first flex. So put your hand in the middle of their chest and have them flex around because they want to bend from the hips and keep their spine straight. Right. No, just, just five degrees, that's all. And stop when it hurts. Stop when it's tight because you don't want them to blow through the adhesions. Right. So bend around your hand. 
and then, and then, and see how far you can get. If 40 and 10 doesn't work, you, I've never had it not work. So maybe no. check the tone in their legs because they may need 81 and 10 at the same time. And oh. then torn and broken in the connective tissue and the ligaments in the neck and you're treating scar tissue in the nerves at the same time. It's not a one visit fix, but it's also not terrifying. You can do this, Marty. It's like, nope. There was another question that she had. I'm just trying to grab it now. Um, where did it go? Was it, it was on the chat, I think, following. Does FSM help with mouth breathing slash nasal problems? Depending on what they are. Depending <laughs> on what they are. So nasal problems, um, yeah, they, there's, wow. Okay, that's a whole webinar. That um, is a whole webinar. What time is it? We don't okay. have enough time. <laughs> yes, we do. I can okay. do okay. Unless you have another, unless you have another topic, but. You're good, so, yes. Nasal congestion. We're assuming that they've seen an ENT that has evaluated them. If they haven't seen an ENT, they need a CT scan of their sinuses to see if the sinus lining is thickened and if they have an infection. Okay. The other thing is you ask them, do you have root canals? If they have even one root canal in the upper jaw, infection, right? So you have, then you find somebody that has a 3D cone beam and you do a, a 3D cone beam of the jaw and see if the bone here is infected. Because we know for me that the infection in my upper jaw had eaten through to the floor of the sinuses. And um, there was an anaerobic infection from the jaw, a biofilm, an aerobic infection, and then a biofilm and then mold. And it took six years on antibiotics and on anti and nasal Beg spray and uh, Flonase to the key to fixing the sinuses is drainage. Sure. You've got to open up the passages. I don't want to use drugs. Get over it. So there's a reason that God invented Flonase and <laughs> it's over the counter. Yeah. It, you have to decongest the tiny little openings in the sinuses so they'll drain and then you can get after it with silver. Argentin 23 is available to, by two practitioners. So that is a high concentration of silver. Um, the over-the-counter version is like 18 and 23 is better. It'll kill, it kills virus, mold, bacteria, whatever. And then mouth breathing, um, if they can breathe through their sinuses, sometimes mouth breathing is just a habit. Right. That's but first you have to fix their sinuses before. And then you get a watch pad. It's worth the $5,000. I love it. And you do sleep studies. Yeah. So there. Okay. We cannot conclude today without me sharing this quote because, um, you and I both know him, Dr. Charlie Weingroff. He means the world to me for so many different um, reasons. Yes. Not sure if he's listening live, but um, he has a quote that I ran across and I texted him. I'm like, can I please share this today in the podcast? And it gives me this little thumbs up. He's a man of um, brilliance. He's a doctor of physical therapy. You can see him on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. He's got his own courses about rehabilitation that are mind-blowingly brilliant so you can go on his website to take a look but i want to share this plus fsm plus fsm he's he's brilliant with that as well we do not have body systems we have a body everything is connected physiological body systems are all interconnected even the slightest lack of integrity in any one joint can affect the nervous system at rest and the musculoskeletal system during movement it all matters all the time, whether we feel it or not. Oh, yeah. Ugh. He speaks like this in like these, these beautiful um, loaded paragraphs, but I thought that was so perfect for 
what we do. It is all connected, whether we feel it or not. And it is our job to find those links for people. And, be, and FSM makes it simpler because it gives you a tool that lets you treat the whole system. Yes. How, how else on the planet can you tell the hippocampus that it, that it needs to go take a nap and just it's it, just go take a nap and in an hour we'll wake you up and it will we'll let you out and then it'll be <laughs> this where can you do that right? i don't know i don't know but i'm so grateful that we can do it here his yeah. name again for the question is charlie weingroff that's w-e-i-n-g-r-o-f-f -F. dr charlie weingroff you are you're the man we love you and that's yeah. it for today at the fastest hour of the week it all that is a true story <laughs> thanks everybody for listening i'm going to keep adding everything to the stack we have a lot to get through before our blossoming theme ends so keep the questions and comments coming we will get to them i promise and we will see you in a week from now see you next week bye bye the Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.